it's Lizzie. How are you? Thanks for hanging out with me. This video is five beginner tips for anyone who's converting into Catholicism. I haven't done a live stream on Catholicism for a while, just because this year I've been really intensifying my prayer life and really working on building virtue, changing and developing parts myself. So my Catholicism content on here has always been very like head knowledge type stuff rather than kind of like experiencing and emotional. So this video is not just truths proving Catholicism, but it's going to be very much talking about what it's like converting, ways to support yourself, and kind of the experiential emotional part as you're discovering the intellectual. So five beginner tips for converting into Catholicism. One, don't get caught up in church controversy online. Number two, experience Catholicism, become integrated into a community. Number three, sacrificially spend your time to learn as much as possible. Read, read, read. Four, tell people in your life why you're doing this as soon as possible. The sooner you share it, the more likely they will convert with you. And number five, be patient with yourself. Go at your own pace. Be as gradual as you want. Okay, so number one, <laughs> don't get caught up in church controversy you see online. So you guys are watching this video on YouTube right now, and a lot of you probably learn about Catholicism through YouTube videos and other social media. So it's important for me, I've been Catholic for four years. I've been kind of seeing the Catholicism online for five years. And so it's really important if you're new here to warn you that the internet can create a false image of Catholicism. The internet does not represent reality. Do not get emotionally affected and invested by church controversies you read online do not let things you see on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, CNN, Fox News, New York Times affect the way you view Catholicism. Focus on reading books about Catholic theology and Catholic history. Learn about the Catholic saints throughout 2000 years of our church. Focus on talking to your priests, talking to Catholics in your life, Catholics at your parish. Read your Bible in depth. Pray together with other Catholics, follow along with the daily scripture readings, go to daily mass as much as possible, use Catholic iPhone apps like Laudate, Magnificat, and Hallow, get a holy water fountain for your home, buy some icons, but do not let the things you read on the internet be in your headspace and control your image of what Catholicism is and what Catholics are like. If Twitter is the main place you're learning about Catholicism, finding Catholic community, vibing with Catholicism, that's not healthy and it's just not reality. Even if you have a positive experience online, you have to focus on your own faith and on the Catholics around you. That's what is going to integrate you into the church and strengthen your faith. Okay, so beyond just what's happening toxic in the Catholic world, I'm going to start talking about three organizations to definitely avoid. So number one, the National Catholic Reporter is very heretical, and so I would avoid. Of course, you can read articles from people who are toxic or wrong, but don't take it as like the truth of Catholicism. So, I mean, I personally just avoid it. So it's the National Catholic Reporter, which is very different from the Na National Catholic Register, which is like with EWTN. So don't get them confused. The National Catholic Reporter, heretical. Also, Church Militant is an extremely mean-spirited extremist group that does not represent Catholicism. So avoid Church Militant. Also, there's an organization called Catholics for Choice, which has been in the news a lot lately. They're extremely heretical. Their bishop has completely shut them down, called them out for being horrible, compared them to Judas the Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, betraying him in the nighttime. So avoid National Catholic Reporter, Church Militant, Catholics for Choice. But also, if you live in the U.S., our traditional media 
talking and reporting on Catholicism, on the Vatican, on Pope Francis, you also want to avoid. I mean, of course you can read it, but don't let it affect your view of the church. So CNN, Fox News, New York Times, our own president, everyone will report things that Pope Francis said. It is generally a new thing that the Pope is getting, like everyone knows what he's saying and doing just because of technology, we're able to communicate with the whole world immediately. And so this is a brand new thing in Catholic history and there's positives to it. There's huge negatives to it. So the negative is that it is creating a false narrative and misrepresenting Pope Francis and church controversies, what's going on with everything. So particularly it has to do with Pope Francis. I read quotes of what he says in news articles in US news. And then I read the full quote of what he said and it is completely different than what they're reporting on. So you cannot rely on non-Catholic news stories and sometimes even Catholic news for what's going on. And I think that if you're only reading about the church from traditional media, you will develop negative feelings towards Pope Francis and the Vatican. And so it's important to just remember that we're living in a non-Catholic country. Our entire education system has huge Catholic bias. There's so many misrepresentations and lies about Catholic theology and history. And there's also huge misrepresentations reporting on what Catholicism is doing. Even if Pope Francis is saying or doing horrible things, it doesn't need to be a huge part of your life. I know this might be shocking to people who are converting because you think that we view the Pope so highly, but ultimately he's part of the teaching magisterium to protect the church dogmas, to protect our objective truth theologies about God. But when it comes to what he's saying, statements, his personal life, it honestly doesn't need to be a big part of your faith. And if you feel like you're just getting very angry and invested on in all these things you're reading, just ignore it. You don't need to keep up with what's going on in the church. You don't need to keep up with the Vatican and the Pope. So if this is like affecting your negative headspace, like I said, focus on going to daily mass, focus on your prayer life, focus on your priest at your parish, you know, focus on your soul, your spiritual growth, the people in your real life around you. Don't let this, this spin and negativity about Catholicism affect your Catholic faith. Another thing really important. So a lot of you, if you're, you've been here for a few weeks, you've probably heard of the Latin Catholic community who attend Latin mass every Sunday, who call themselves trads, traditional Catholics, lowercase t. So a lot of that can be, they have very strong opinions and they can cause a lot of controversy, get a lot of backlash. And it's important to remember that people attending Latin mass, it's less than 1% of Catholics in the US less than 1% of Catholics in the world. This is not reality. This is not how the majority of Catholics in the country are. It's not what the majority of Catholics in the country believe. And I've gone to Latin mass for months at a time. I know a lot of people who attend Latin mass and these people in person in real life are nothing like on Twitter and you know, YouTubers, Latin Catholic trads online, it is not even representative of actual Latin Catholics in real life. So if you feel like, you know, you're on Twitter a lot and there's just the really negative energy and negative vibe from Catholics online, that is not reality. That is not how the vast majority of Catholics are. Don't let that get you down. Don't let that give you this negative essence, negative vibe, negative energy about what Catholicism is. Focus on your own parish, your own prayer life, and read Catholic history and theology. Okay, so number two. Oh, and also just in your life in general, you should probably be spending less time on social media, more time, I'm plugging my phone, more time being present with other people, more time reading and cleaning, going to the beach, you know what I mean? Like doing things in your life rather than being online. Okay, 
So number two, surprisingly, I'm not saying for number one or number two, read books, read books, read books. I will talk about that though. But number two is to get very involved in a Catholic church. We call Catholic churches the parish. We call the Christians at the Catholic church parishioners. A parish is an individual church and then a county of Catholic churches is called a diocese. And then a big diocese is called an archdiocese. So it's like Catholic counties ruled by a bishop is in charge of each diocese. So to fully understand and learn about and know Catholicism, you have to experience it. In the US and in a lot of other Western countries, we have this enlightenment idea where knowledge is all about only about intellectual truths. And it's this separation of like head knowledge and learning historical facts. And then like the emotional experience of living out an idea, we've completely separated them and we view knowledge as this mere intellectual pursuit. And so when you're converting into Catholicism, I think instinctively in a Western country, we think, okay, I'm just going to read a ton of books. I'm going to do a ton of research. That's going to help me become Catholic. Of course, that's absolutely mandatory and crucial and necessary, but you cannot separate it from the experiential part of the church. Thank you for the donation. Christopher Woods, thank you for supporting my channel. Two things. Good book on our doctrines about the Blessed Mother and a good book on the early church. Absolutely. So we have this Western idea. We need to move past, call it out as being wrong, where head knowledge, intellectual, completely separate from experiencing something, brand new concept in world history, brand new toxic concept in world history. So to fully know Catholic theology, it's important to experience mass. It's important to go to mass. It's not only this personal individual reading, it's the experience fully embodied in mass, not only mass, but also in Catholic community. Community is the most important thing. And so as you're reading about the church, you'll learn about Catholicism by being friends and knowing deeply people who are Catholics. I know it's hard right now because of COVID. I know a lot of programs are shut down at churches. Sometimes mass isn't even open, but I really encourage you in the area you live, look around, check at different Catholic churches, find one that has a weekly Bible study, join that. If it's a smaller group, you'll be able to become close friends with people in the Bible study. So I highly recommend find a weekly Bible study at a Catholic church near you. Also, you could join a young adult group if you're in your 20s or 30s. You could join a youth group if you're a teenager. So just find a way to join a small group of Catholics so you can get to know Catholics. You need to have a community, not just to experience and live out the historical truths, but also for emotional support. So it's extremely difficult and turbulent and painful to convert into Catholicism. Every single conversion story I have read in my Instagram DMs, emails, YouTube message, YouTube comment, Facebook message from my viewers involves a lot of chaos. It really uproots your life to convert into Catholicism. A lot of relationships are strained. It can get messy. It's extremely common, I hear all the time, people will stop being friends with someone who says they're going to become Catholic. Family can distance themselves or cut you off. You may lose your entire religious community. So a lot of people who convert also may work at a Protestant church, work at a Protestant school, and will get fired from their job when they convert. Your husband or wife spouse may be completely against you converting. If you have kids who are in middle school or high school, they may be totally confused and not wanting to go along with it. And then your siblings, parents, I mean, it's just like 
losing relationships in your life while you're on this scary intellectual journey makes it even harder. It is so painful psychologically without the relationship, losing relationships in your life, just finding out that it's true is psychologically painful and chaotic. And just to accept that you've been wrong for so long about Christian theology, anyone who really cares about their faith would say that being a Christian is the core of our identity. And so coming to terms with being wrong about the core of your identity is horrible. It's a horrible experience. It involves so much sacrifice, so much dying to yourself. And in that process, you really, really, really need Catholics to support you and people who really care about their faith and especially other Catholic converts. You need people like that in your life when you're going through such a hard time. And I really recommend if there's someone at your church who you've met and they tell you they're a Catholic convert, just reach out to them and be like, hey, can we get lunch sometime? Can we get coffee? Can we spend time together? Can we do a Zoom call if you guys aren't boosted? So yeah, like reach out to someone who's a Catholic convert. Be like, I want to get to know you. I want to hear your story. I have a lot of questions for you. Like take the initiative and form relationships with people because this is going to be a very difficult few years as you're converting in and after because of losing relationships, because of uprooting your life, because of completely shifting the way you view your identity, your spirituality. And so you absolutely need community. And I know it's definitely hard. I think Catholic churches compared to my Protestant communities don't have as many like small groups and Bible studies and everything. So it can be difficult, but keep searching, check around to different churches, find a Bible study. When I started RCIA in um, 2017, in the fall, I was in my weekly RCIA class and we also had a two hour dinner and Bible study at my parish. So I went to that too. And so I got to know like 12 to 15 people at my parish, like every week for two hours spending time together. I really got to know them. And having my RCIA group and Bible study group was amazing because I really got to know other Catholics. And if you're um, like a young person like me, you might feel like, oh, I want to get to know other people in their 20s. No, my church Bible study and RCIA, there were not a lot of young people there. There were people in their 40s, 80s, you know what I mean? Like people all over the age spectrum and it was amazing because I got to know what it's like being a Catholic from all sorts of age groups and generations. And so just because the church Bible study, the church small group, just because it's people who are not in their 20s, don't be like, oh, I'm trying to find a 20s Bible study, like join the Bible study. You will probably learn more about Catholicism and be more supported by people who have been doing this for decades and decades and decades and been within the church through so many controversies and crises. People, you know, they've seen the church's reputation go up and down in the country. They've stayed Catholic through that. It's so cool to have that perspective and that support and definitely reach out to people, ask to get lunch. Do not give up. You can also meet with your priest individually, one-on-one. -on -one. They absolutely love when people want to get to know them. So at my parish, my priest leads RCIA and comes to Bible study. So I got to know my priest really well. It was super easy to get to know him. Some churches are a lot bigger. If there's like hundreds and hundreds of people at the church and there's one or two priests and they're not leading RCIA or Bible study, it might be hard to get to know them. So I really recommend being like, hey, can I take you out to lunch? Hey, can we meet up? And really, really reach out and get to know your priest. And they absolutely love meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one. I think priests, their favorite part of their life is doing mass, doing confessions, and meeting with people one-on-one, -on -one, baptizing people, like last rites, doing things like that, like that one-on-one -on -one 
with Christians, that's priest's favorite thing to do. And so never think, oh, my priest is so busy. He won't want to meet with you. No, he's really excited to meet you. And I mean, even me, I've only been Catholic for four years, but meeting other converts, it's like, ah, it's so much happiness because they, they're so passionate and so excited and so intense about it. And having that in your life it motivates you in your faith and makes you more excited about it. And so absolutely your priest wants to get to know you and support you. And also just participating in mass. I know it can be really awkward and almost scary going to mass just because it's like, you don't know what's going on. People are saying all these prayers together. You don't know what they mean. People are standing and sitting and kneeling and standing and sitting and kneeling. And it's like, you get lost. Like, I don't know how to do everything. Can I even be there? Like sit in the back if you're like self-conscious about it, but you do not have to know what's going on. You do not have to participate in any way, but experiencing mass will really help you experience the theology and history that you're reading. Okay, number three tip for new converts. Learn as much as possible. <laughs> read, read, read. Devote hours every week to reading. If you don't have as much free time to just like sit down and read a physical book, you can do a lot of audiobooks. Your public library will have free audiobooks. A lot of them have an app and you can access like thousands of books. So that's an option. Your public library audio app. Also, you can just use Audible and buy books through there. I know that, um, what books do you recommend? So I have an Amazon playlist that uh, Amazon shop that has a ton of theology books I recommend. So I will link that in the video description when this is up, but you can just Google Lizzie's Answers, Lizzie's Answers Amazon shop and all of my, it will come up with like a ton of books in it that I recommend. So yes, and don't be afraid to just go to a library if you don't have the money to like shell out for books and they'll have a lot of books there. There's a lot of, a ton of stuff online as well. But I do recommend making time in your day to sit down and read physical books. I know for me, I like to write in books and highlight, like write in the margins. It really helps me process it and understand it more. So I really think you should rearrange your life and make time for it. I mean, like if you have time to watch Netflix at night, you have time to read theology books. And something I love to say, <laughs> everyone's busy, everyone's super busy, and you make time for what matters and what's important for you. So it's never an excuse being like, I don't have time. Like no one has time, everyone's busy. And we choose to make time for what matters to us. Choosing to convert into Catholicism ultimately is because it's true, it's objectively true, it's the original church founded by Jesus' apostles. And so becoming Catholic, it isn't because you enjoy the vibe of mass, it isn't because you find Catholic church art beautiful, it isn't because you love that the Catholic church care so much about helping the poor, building hospitals, healing people. It's not because you're inspired by Pope Francis. It's because it's intellectually true. Yes, all the things I just mentioned draw people to Catholicism, and I absolutely think that the church needs to look beautiful in every way and attract people to read more and learn more and learn that it is true. But ultimately, your reason for becoming Catholic is an intellectual one. And I know not everyone is inclined in that way to want to do a ton of research and read a lot. It might not be naturally what your personality is, but you really need to change and grow that part of yourself. 
I know for me, like I hate mass before I was Catholic. It wasn't something that I enjoyed. I really enjoyed like evangelical type Protestant worship. And so I honestly had to change myself to enjoy it. And so I think it's the same way. Like if you're not naturally inclined to wanting to read enough, you need to grow and push yourself in that area. And if you feel like still, you know, I'm not intellectually inclined, I'm not interested in reading that much. When you are confirmed, which is when you're officially like initiated into your into the church at your confirmation so you will get baptized if you've never been baptized before if you already have you'll do your first confession and then at easter mass easter vigil so like the night before easter you will be confirmed and when you are confirmed you actually have to read a statement of faith and you are vowing that you agree with all catholic teaching and so you can't lie. So it like, when you become Catholic, you are saying, I've done a ton of reading and research. I've done all the intellectual vigor and I accept everything that the church teaches as objective theology. And so when you make this statement, you need to mean what you say, you need to understand the dogmas of Catholicism, and you need to accept them. And acceptance, it, I'm going to talk about this with number five, like it is a struggle. It's something that you should debate within yourself. You can disagree, ask a ton of questions. I hate this. Like it is, a, it's supposed to be an intense, turbulent process, accepting it. So it's never this like, you know, blindly accept all these things. Like it totally should be a fight within yourself, wanting to understand it and prove it to yourself. But ultimately like you are saying you agree with all of this. And so you have to come from an intellectual place of wanting to learn everything. You have to become passionate in understanding church history, knowing the sacraments, learning the stories of the early Christians, understanding major church councils, heretical crises, the composition of the Bible, reading the church father writings who are the early Christian theologians in the first few centuries, the church fathers, reading their writings, knowing what they believed, learning what the trinity the priesthood mary the pope you have to care you have to put sacrificial time into learning all of this and of course you have the rest of your life to learn about catholicism so don't get overwhelmed you don't have to know everything in one year by the time you get confirmed and it's amazing because our church has existed for 2000 years so You'll never run out of books on theology, saints, church history. There's so much to know. So you don't have to know every detail of church history, but you do need to know the basic dogmas, theology, the sacraments, what they mean, all of these things. And every Catholic convert goes through an eight month class called RCIA, which stands for Rite of Christian Initiation of Adults. So there is an official class you go to to learn, but um, in the United States, a lot of the classes are not very good. They're not in depth. So everything I learned about Catholic theology was mostly through my personal research. And I honestly would not have known that much if I didn't take the initiative to read on my own. So I really recommend doing personal research, personal reading. Like I said, you can look at my Amazon shop. If you Google Lizzie's Answers Amazon shop, I have a giant shop with like a ton of books in it that I recommend. Something else I recommend if you're someone who isn't naturally inclined to do a ton of reading, I really recommend the Word on Fire app, which is Bishop Barron's company. He, it's like Netflix, it's a subscription service that's totally worth paying for. He has his Catholicism series and his Pivotal Players series, which is about saints. 
And so it's beautifully edited videos. It has a ton of church history, a ton of theology, but the way it's edited is just beautiful. He travels around the world to Catholic holy sites to where the Bible took place, all these things. And so it's like beautifully edited videos, but talking about a ton of content. And so if you're someone who's like, I don't wanna read a ton of books, you can watch the Catholicism series. I learned a ton through there. Also Pivotal Players is about the saints. So I really recommend watching Bishop Barron's videos. Actually in my RCIA, we watched the Catholicism series. And then in one of my church's Bible studies a year later, we watched Pivotal Players. And so I have watched through the Word on Fire app videos multiple times when I was becoming Catholic and I found it extremely helpful. So I very much recommend that as well because it's like fun to watch. Not that reading isn't fun, but you know what I mean? Like there's like a ton of shots going on. There's beautiful churches. There's pictures of people. Like it's a very well put together series. So I think it will be extremely enlightening and helpful especially if you're the type of person who does not like reading and just like sitting down and learning a ton of things. Okay, number four, extremely important is evangelism. You might think I'm not even Catholic yet. How am I possibly going to evangelize and get other people to become Catholic? I don't know anything. So that's wrong. You need to tell people in your life that you are converting, that you're thinking about converting and why you want to convert as soon as possible. This will ensure and increase the likelihood that other people will convert. Yes, the sooner you tell people that you're thinking about converting, the more likely they will convert with you. Many converts, including myself, I mean, like four years ago, not currently, but many converts feel like they don't know enough information yet to start talking about it to their friends and family because they're scared. What if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer to it? And then it makes me look like I'm not intelligent and I'm not making the right decision. So people feel like they can't talk about it until they have like answers to every question someone will ask, but that is not what you should do. You should not wait. It's better for you to not know all the information and start sharing it when you're not 100% sure. So instead of being like, I'm an RCIA right now, I'm going to become Catholic, it's better five months earlier to be like, I just started reading this book. It's starting to change your thinking towards becoming Catholic. That is when you want to start talking about it. So be like, hey, I just started reading this book. It's talking about the Christian view of the Eucharist through the years. Chapter two is talking about the second century. I'm reading about it and I realized our Protestant church doesn't think like that. It kind of reminds me of the way Catholics might view it. Here is chapter two. Can you read these three pages right now? I'd love to know your perspective on it. Something like that. Don't just like talk at people, but like show them what you're reading. Have them read excerpts of what you're reading. Also, there's so many Catholic YouTube videos and they can be extremely helpful of course, lots of people come across my YouTube videos and they share them with people in their lives to explain why Catholicism is true. So definitely use my YouTube content as much as possible. I have over a hundred videos. So I've talked about every hot topic and question people have. So definitely utilize my videos. Like I said, a lot of people are not as like intellectually inclined and so if they're not gonna read like a 300 page book with you, send them a YouTube video. Another example of a way to talk to people about how you're thinking being Catholic, you can be like, YouTube just recommended me this YouTube channel called Bishop Barron. 
It's so weird. I was so uncomfortable. I've never heard a priest or a bishop speak before. The video I found, he was talking about how postmodern culture is viewing Christianity differently than it had been viewed in the past. Do you wanna sit and watch this seven minute YouTube video with me? Do something like that. Get people in your life involved in your process, in your thinking, in what you're listening to. And don't view it as like, I found the truth, you're wrong. Instead, have this perspective of like, I want to have a discussion together. I'm on this journey. I don't know if I'll convert right now or not thinking about it. You know what I mean? Don't have this like, I found truth, you're wrong, change to agree with me. Be like, can you be involved in this process with me? I don't know this journey where it's gonna lead me, but I've really enjoyed what I've read so far about Christian history. So really, really involve people in the content of what you're doing. And like I said, the sooner you talk about it, the more likely people in your life will convert with you. So if you keep it to yourself and let's say, you know, you, you read your first theology book talking about things or you found your first Lizzie's Answers YouTube video about Catholicism in like March and then in, in September you join RCIA and you tell people, oh, I'm going to become Catholic. It, they're, they're like, what is going on? <laughs> they're not going to necessarily believe you that in March you wanted to be Catholic because as humans, like our minds are set up to avoid pain. And so for someone who's anti-Catholic, who 0% believe Catholicism is true, if they suddenly hear that like their best friend or their family member is becoming Catholic, their brain is not going to automatically believe you that like, oh, in March you've read about this for six months. Like people are not going to believe that off the bat. Instead, they're like, well, you've been spending a lot of time with your coworker who's Catholic. They brainwashed you. You know what I mean? Like they're literally listening to your narrative of what happened. And so if in March you just began talking about it and shared your entire journey, they know what's real and they know what happened because they were there the whole time. And so it's better to just share as soon as possible. A lot of people are scared of how people will react. And listen, people are gonna have a horrible reaction regardless, a lot of people in your life, the sooner the better. They're gonna be angry regardless. I know you might wanna prolong losing relationships and losing people in your life, but believe me, if they're aware of it earlier on, it will be better. And I know a lot of people, I know a lot of people will think people in my life are extremely close-minded. It's better to learn everything and then present them with all the evidence that is more likely to get them to convert if I have all the answers, but that's not true. People are very complicated and we're more emotional than we realize. So most people, they can read all of the evidence and they will not convert. Like 99% of people, They're, they can't just like read all these sources. People have to be in a place of humility where they're open to it. And so even if, you know, you tell them eight months later, once you've decided to convert that you want to convert and you have a really good debate with them and explain everything to them, like people aren't like that. Just because you have all the answers does not mean people will convert. And so it's way better to share the process from the very beginning, because then you can share a few pages of a book with them. You can send them an article. You can send them an Ascension Presents video. You can send them a Lizzie's Answers theology video. They see the process happening gradually. And I know there will be people who, when you tell them you're looking into it, will cut you off. That will happen. And it sucks. It's gonna be horrible. I know people are putting it off because they don't wanna lose their family members and their friends. I totally get it. But if from the beginning you invite them into the process with you and you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do so far, allowing them to read the sources with you before you've decided 100% is just like objectively going to increase the likelihood that they'll convert with you.
Isn't this super cute? My flower zebra print water bottle. My best friend got it for me. So yeah. And like I said, the number one fear is that you won't have an answer to their question. And so if you, from the very beginning are talking to them about this, you can say, yeah, I don't know yet if Catholicism is true, I'll look into it and get back to you. And if you're in the situation where you're already an RCIA and already want to become Catholic, what you can say if someone asks a question and you don't know the answer to it, you can be like, I, wait, I wrote down exactly what to say. Okay, you can say, I don't have an in-depth answer to that right now, but when I get back home, I'll text you a couple articles talking about it. So if someone genuinely cares about truth and is open-minded, they will read the articles. But if they're not open-minded at all and do not want to change, having firing out a two sentence perfect response isn't going to change them either. And so if you don't have the answer to something, be like, I'll get back to you. I'll send you an article about it when I get back home. And honestly, if you don't know the answer in the moment, but then can send them an article and they read a four page article, that probably will have more of an impact on them than if you had a perfect answer in the moment. And humility is an amazing virtue. So I know you feel the pressure like, oh, they'll think I'm not making an intellectually robust decision if you can't answer every question. But actually, it's better to have humility and to say, you know, I don't know right now, but I'll get back to you. You could also, if you're already an RCIA and you can't answer someone's question, you can be like, you know, like, I'm still not 100% certain about this. I'm still learning. This is something I'm still deciding about. And I'll get back to you. I'd love to have a discussion on it. So even in RCIA, a lot of people don't realize this. That does not mean you're becoming Catholic. A lot of people drop out of RCIA. And so you can explain to people in your life, like let's say you were like me and you waited to tell people for months and months and months, and now you're in RCIA. If you have a discussion with a family member or friend and you don't know the answer to their question, you could be like, listen, like, I know I'm in RCIA, but that doesn't mean I'm going to follow through and be Catholic. This is just a place to learn more and have discussions and debate. This doesn't mean I'm going to become Catholic. I'm just learning about it more and I'm likely to become Catholic, but I'm obviously very open to being wrong on this and I would love to hear your thoughts. And so even if you are an RCIA, present it in a way that you're not like, I'm becoming Catholic 100%. Even if you are becoming Catholic 100%, you can be like, I'm still open to be being proven wrong. Like I would love to hear your perspective. Like I'll send you an article. If you send me an article, like I'll read a book that you recommend to me against Catholicism if you want to read a book I have. So just have that sense of like you're open to being wrong on it. You know what I mean? Rather than having this rigid like I'm right, you're wrong. So yes, involve people as much as possible and literally seeing someone convert in is the strongest, strongest thing that will make people in your life want to convert. Because, you know, a lot of people are Catholic, they have beautiful lives, they're hardworking, they're sacrificial, they're fun, they're intellectual. You can know Catholics in your life and it can make the church look beautiful. And people can wonder like, what is it about them that makes them like that, which attracts you to the faith because of their character and how they live. But ultimately, like I said, it's about whether or not Catholicism is historically the original church. And so when someone sees someone in their life choose to become Catholic and to completely change their beliefs, that's something where they're like, what? People convert into Catholicism? Because a lot of people don't know any Catholic converts ever, even though there's like tens of thousands of Catholic converts. People don't know anyone who is. So once you personally know like, whoa, someone wants to become Catholic, they're changing their position. It's not just because they grew up with it. Like seeing a, knowing a Catholic convert personally is like a huge thing that will make people in your life convert. And so from the very beginning of your process, understand like you have the power to really influence people and affect them. And so I think, 
from the beginning, it is really, really cool to be praying for other people in your life. I know it's overwhelming what you're going through, but pray that your conversations over the next year of you converting will help other people become Catholic too in your life. And so even though you're new and don't have all the answers, you actually, people are way more likely to listen to you who's still in the questioning process than someone who's already Catholic. So yes, like I said with number three, it's really important to read and read and read and learn and learn and learn and be able to answer people's questions. Like that's amazing. It's great being able to have responses. And I'm at a point now where pretty much like any theology question someone asks, I have an answer to it when it comes to like basics. So yeah, a conversation now, I will be able to explain it to people and quote things to them and stuff. And that's amazing. But ultimately, like when you don't know everything, that can be even more powerful. So definitely read as much as possible. You should be extremely motivated to be able to answer questions, but do not let that keep you from talking about it from the beginning. Number five tip for new Catholics is to be patient with yourself. So this is a huge decision. It's a huge life change and it's okay to move slow emotionally and to move slow intellectually. A lot of people don't know, but in the second century, RCIA was three years in some parts of the Christian world, three years. That's how long they thought it took to learn how to live as a Catholic and to understand Catholic theology three years. Now, our RCIA is eight months. It's not even one year. And so if you feel like you need two years to convert in, if you need more time, give it to yourself. And I mean, a lot of times people are like, I'm gonna give myself two years. And then they're like, no, I wanna be Catholic. Like a lot of people want to receive the Eucharist. So they're willing to, you know, be courageous and brave and like fight through all those emotional barriers. But you do not have to go into it being like, I'm gonna become Catholic in eight months. Like if you're not ready, that's okay. So for me, I, did not understand a lot of parts of mass when I started going to mass. And I felt very uncomfortable with things like the sign of the cross, holy water, kneeling during mass. I didn't know what they meant. It seemed, it felt sketchy. I was uncomfortable with it. And so at mass even, never, ever, ever feel like you have to participate in everything. And a lot of people are like, oh, like if I'm not doing everything, if I don't know the prayers, if I don't know when to kneel and stand, like, oh, I can't go, I don't know what's going on. Absolutely not. There are so many Catholic converts. Every Catholic knows there's a ton of converts. When people are officially become part of the church, it's at mass when everyone's there. And so every year Catholics see people become Catholic. So it's just a thing where everyone knows there's converts. And so if you don't know what's going on at mass, people will assume you're a convert. And also people are like, oh, I'm not going up to receive the Eucharist, that's so awkward. People are like, oh, they're a convert. Or they're like, oh, they need to go to confession. Like no one judges you for not going up to receive the Eucharist. It's actually like people respect it because they're like, wow, they really value the sacrament of confession. And sometimes people would, like if, um, so let's say I'm like sitting in a row and there's people to the right of me and we're going to the center to walk up to receive the Eucharist. So like when I was not Catholic yet, but going to mass, I would like stand up and then be like, oh, go in front of me. And they'd be like, oh no, you can go. And I'm like, oh, I'm not Catholic yet. I'm in RCIA. And they're like, oh, I'm so happy. So yeah, people don't care what you're doing at mass. Obviously don't like stand up and flail your arms or anything. And if you're a little like self-conscious about like not knowing what's going on, then you can sit in the back, but never feel like you have to participate in every part of mass. If you don't know what something is, don't do it. Okay, I mean, you can, but 
you don't have to feel like you're going against your conscience or something. Okay. So also with theology, give yourself time. Like I said, at some points in church history, it was three years. So for most people, when they join RCIA, if they they're not a hundred percent about it. Most people in RCIA are not a hundred percent. They're there to learn more. And yes, like I said, when you get confirmed, you vow in front of the church that you agree with all Catholic teaching, but joining RCIA doesn't mean you're going to go through with the ceremony and become officially initiated into the church. Um, accepting all of these things should not be a blind acceptance. It's normal and I recommend to push back, to disagree, to debate, to allow yourself to be uncomfortable with it, to make other people uncomfortable who are in those discussions. It's totally normal to be like, what's the historical evidence for this? When did this begin? Why do people feel this? What, when do we see purgatory? When do we see the Deuterocanonical books of the Old Testament as part of the biblical canon? You should be asking a ton of questions, really struggling with this. And I know for me, I disagreed with a ton of things. Like even in my videos, when I was like, I, I want to be Catholic or like, I think Catholicism is true. I'm like, I will never change my view on this. So yeah, even for me, when I knew, when I believed in the real presence of the Eucharist and everything, I still was like, yes, I want to be Catholic, but I'll never change my mind on this. And so it's totally normal. Everyone goes through that where even if they know they want to convert, they're like, I hate this issue. I will never change my mind on this. So that's totally normal to feel like that and to think like that. And pretty much everyone else in RCIA is the same way where there's things that they currently disagree with and reject. And so that's totally fine. Never feel like you can't join RCIA or like you can't go to mass because you disagree with parts of it or you don't understand part of it. It's totally fine to disagree. And I actually think it, like, let's say everyone in RCIA does agree with church teaching and they're going along with it. I think it would be good for their faith and their intellectual development to have someone in RCIA who's like, what evidence is there for that? You're wrong. I don't agree with that historical argument. Like having someone in RCIA who like is against it will give the leader good pushback and they'll be able to present better arguments and evidence for it because you're disagreeing with it. And so, yeah, come to RCIA if you hate certain theologies, like you'll create a great dynamic in class. Actually, one of my friends who became Catholic in um, 2019, there were a lot of people in RCIA who were already Catholics who just liked attending RCIA because of the teacher, which actually my RCIA is the same way, where some people like attend it who are already Catholic and stuff. But she said, she said something about Mary once because she disagreed with like the theology on Mary. And she said everyone like gasped and like someone started crying because they were like so offended because they were lifelong Catholics. But like, no, it's good to make people uncomfortable. Even people who are Catholic already, like it's good for them to hear the other perspective and like how Protestants feel about certain things. And so, yeah, be the one in RCIA who hates things. <laughs> but yeah, it should be this intensive wrestling match within your head on all the issues. Like for me, I had to prove everything to myself. Like everything was like, I disagree with this. I hate this. This is against my intuition. Why do Catholics think it's true? For every single issue. And ultimately, like, there does come a point where you can trust the teaching magisterium. The teaching magisterium is the oral traditions of the apostles that have been passed down and scripture. And then the pope, the bishops, all of that together is the teaching magisterium, which we believe the Holy Spirit is protecting. So once we've proven the bishops and pope and church authority and how they have preserved the oral traditions that 
teach us how to interpret the Bible. Once you've proven the church authority, you can like intellectually trust everything they're teaching. And I think people totally do that. But I know for me and for other converts I've talked to, even once you accept the teaching magisterium, you still want to know the reasoning for every single theology. So you do not have to be a person who understands the teaching magisterium and has been like, okay, I agree with all of this. I want to understand more. Like if you're the person who's like, I agree with the teaching magisterium and I hate the teachings on sex or I hate the teachings about Mary or I hate infant baptism. If you're the person who hates everything, <laughs> that's totally fine. Go at your own pace. And I actually, once I joined RCIA, I knew I wanted to be Catholic in May and I joined RCIA in September. Yeah, so I had four months of when I agreed with, I knew I wanted to be Catholic. And so I had four months to kind of like be angry about things <laughs> and like debate and you know what I mean? And so I actually am glad I got it out of my system where I like hated everything because I think it would have been a chaotic environment in RCIA, but honestly, maybe it would have been good. Like maybe it would have created a better, you know, helped everyone understand better because I hated everything. But yeah, and I just want to repeat, when you join RCIA, it does not mean you're going to come into the church at Easter. Lots of people drop out of RCIA. So it is not something where it's like, I want to be Catholic. I'm going to be Catholic. It's a place you can go to have discussions about it, to debate and ask questions. Something else really important is on an emotional level, it may take time. I know a lot of people actually are attracted to Catholicism on an emotional level because of how beautiful the mass is. But for me, nope. For me, I did not like it. So it actually took me a long time emotionally to trust it and to like it, honestly. Like I agreed with it intellectually, but emotionally it took a long time. And so if you feel like you don't trust the church, if you're scared by certain theology, if things make you incredibly uncomfortable, that's fine. <laughs> Like the Mary theology, for example, like for like two or three years after becoming Catholic, I still was uncomfortable looking at a Mary statue. Sometimes I still am, literally. Sometimes I still am uncomfortable with reading things about Mary. And that's just because I grew up Protestant my whole life. Like it's fine to have these emotions where you're uncomfortable with things and disagree with things and struggle. Like it's a huge life change and it's not something that in eight months you're going to be okay with emotionally. So it's fine to feel a lot of things. And I know I felt guilt at certain times because of how uncomfortable I was with Mary and other things. I didn't like that I felt like that. But looking back, I think it's beautiful that I didn't, you know, just like we're human. We're not like machines who can just like change how we felt for two decades. So it's normal. It's okay. Something else is that a lot of the saint devotions are not something you have to start doing when you get initiated into the church, when you get confirmed. So for me, like I'd never prayed a rosary before when I was confirmed. Like I did not, I don't think I asked any saints to pray for me. Like Marian stuff was not a part of my life and it doesn't need to be part of your life. I think I encourage people to ask saints to pray for them. I encourage people to pray the rosary and I think it's an amazing addition to your faith. I think, I think it's integral to understand Mary's role in the church and to pray the rosary and all these things. Like I think that's important and I think it will benefit your faith. But if you're new and you're uncomfortable with Mary's role in Catholicism, you don't have to pray the rosary. Don't do it if you're uncomfortable with it, if you hate it. Like, yes, you should challenge yourself, but like, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Like, you're not forced to do it. And I think it was extremely calming to me 
that when I was in RCIA and when I was confirmed, I wasn't forced to pray a rosary. I wasn't forced to ask Mary to pray for me. I wasn't forced to read a book about Mary. Like one Catholic told me that I shouldn't ignore the Mary theology. And if I lead with that, it will help me understand everything else more. And I was like, okay, even if you're right, not doing that. <laughs> So for me, I didn't accept emotionally any of the Mary stuff or any Marian devotion stuff way after I was confirmed. Seriously, I didn't, I didn't want to do it, so I didn't do it. So there's no pressure to be a practicing Catholic in good standing. You do not have to ask Mary to pray for you. You never have to pray a rosary. That's not required to be Catholic. And I think it's great that it's not required just because for converts, it is very hard emotionally. Okay, it's been exactly one hour since I started streaming. I, when I posted this on my Instagram story, I was like the last hour is Q and A and it's been exactly an hour. So now we could do Q and A. <laughs> <laughs> people are debating with each other it's very interesting live streaming because I like to live stream my phone and the comments only show up like three at a time and then they disappear and even when I'm on my computer and I can see like 10 comments at a time because I'm talking and looking at the camera and thinking about what I'm saying like I'm not reading every comment and a lot of people are like, she's intentionally avoiding my comments. <laughs> and I'll, I'll read a comment. You're intentionally avoiding all my comments. You're a coward. You don't want to address my question. And that's my first time ever seeing their username on my channel. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> not ignoring you. Dennis Constalis, thank you so much for the donation. Thank you for being here. Enjoy your presence. So yes, I don't ignore people. Actually, I think twice I remember ignoring comments because I was like, I don't want to answer them. So sometimes I do, but it's very rare. Like most of the time, I'm just not seeing your comment at all. Okay. And Tony knows Kemenos. How can I discern whether or not I'm ready to convert before Easter? Currently an RCIA. So it's really important to talk to your RCIA director or your priest or someone who is a Catholic convert who's already Catholic. I would talk to them and ask them when they knew they were ready and they can ask you questions asking where you're at. Um, I think the most important thing is at your confirmation, you're vowing, you agree with all church teaching. I think that's the most important thing. And so if you don't have time to learn everything, that's a lie. Like you're not supposed, you will lie. And so it's really important to understand, ev not everything, but you know, the basics of Catholic theology. And so I would talk to your RCIA director and be like, can you give me a list of everything I need to understand on a basic level when I get confirmed? And maybe having a list will help you out. But ultimately it is your RCIA director's decision on whether or not you can get confirmed. And actually my fiance, he, I think he joined RCIA not in like August or September. And he wanted to get confirmed at Easter and his RCIA director was like, no, you need more time, <laughs> which was good. So he could like accept everything. So yeah, some people do get held back and it's ultimately like completely up to you. I think a lot of people want to for the Eucharist, but it is much better to wait another year to get confirmed and then stay Catholic your whole life rather than rushing into it and not being ready and then leaving Catholicism. Like I think long-term in staying Catholic, it will be better to wait. And of course, not for everyone. And people get confirmed not only on Easter. So you don't have to wait another year. You could get confirmed in July or September or December. You know what I mean? You can get confirmed all throughout the year. And so it's not like you have to wait another year. But I mean, if you're asking the question where you don't feel ready, maybe you're not ready. But also there's this one woman in my RCIA who was like, I'm not ready, I don't know everything.
everything like for for two years and my priest was like no like i think you're ready i think you can do it so you're never going to know everything 2000 years of the church but you just have to make sure that you're not lying when you say you agree with all church teaching Vani asks, Lizzie, when will your book come out? So never is my current answer on it. I was really affected by the Prince Harry and Meghan Markle situation, which is very random that this affected my book. But when they did their interview and were just talking about everything horrible that his family did, that the royal family did, I totally understand that it was wrong. It clearly was wrong if what they were saying was what happened. And I hated it though. I did not like that they brought that into the open and made their family look bad, even if it was the truth. And so I was just like, that is not okay to publicly talk about it. And for me, because I'm like a smaller YouTube channel, I always have just viewed my channel as like my journal, like my diary. I'm just sharing all these parts of myself. And because it's a smaller channel, I always just kind of had this attitude that it's like my small corner of the internet. And exemplifying the same principle of talking about your family publicly, but seeing it on a bigger level really was an eye opener for me. And I was like, no, I'm not comfortable with talking bad about your family and talking about your family, it's not okay. So that did it. I made the connection. And I also think that as I get older, I understand the world more and gain more wisdom. So I think that's it as well. But yeah, I actually removed a lot of my videos on YouTube recently. I have been going through my whole YouTube channel and removing videos. So I just removed any video where I said things about my family. I just think they're my family and any issues in a family should stay in the family. And I just, I think it's hard because I've been doing my YouTube for 12 years and it's just, you know, it started me just filming in my bedroom. <laughs> and so it's difficult for me to have perspective of like, how many people, how there's, it's not private. It's very, very, very public. And from my perspective, it doesn't feel like that, but it is very public. And so I just thought, I don't wanna come out with a book where I speak about my family, about my friends. And of course, everyone who's in the book, I was going to send them their section and have them approve it. And so of course, if I came out with the book, I would have done that with my family, but they, they would have said no. <laughs> and even if they were okay with it, like I'm not okay with it. So that's that. And it's very interesting because the same thing just happened with Britney Spears where her sister came out with a book and she was talking negatively about her. Well, probably lying. And that also was just like another reminder that like, it's not okay to write books di di dishing on your family because they're your family. Like you work things out in your family. And yeah, I guess loyalty is a trait that I want to develop in myself. <laughs> Kurt Whitley, hey Lizzie, what was your reaction to St. Irenaeus being proclaimed a doctor of the church? I was so excited. It is surprising to like everyone that he wasn't already a doctor of the church, like everyone already thought so. He's talked about as the father of Mariology because he was one of the first people to write in depth what the church believed at that time about Mary. So of course I chose him because I would not have become Catholic without him because of living in the second century, he was the one who authenticated which were the true gospels, him and St. Hippolytus. He talked about the Roman bishop's role. He talked about infant baptism, the Eucharist, Mary being the new Eve, all of these things, apostolic succession, oh my goodness. And against heresies, there's like a huge passage about apostolic succession. And then it's very beautiful. 
And then he talks about the Roman bishop succession. And he has a list of like every pope since the beginning. Like this person, this person, this. And it's like, yeah. And just the way he wrote about the Roman bishop. So yes, would not have become Catholic without him. And a big reason that I trusted him is because the apostle John, who is the only apostle who stayed with Jesus when he was crucified. So John taught Polycarp, who was a bishop. He was like a student of John. And so we can read Polycarp's writings, but then Polycarp taught Irenaeus. And that connection, someone made me aware of like very early on when I was researching Catholicism. And it's just crazy because like when you're Protestant, you have the Bible and you don't really think about what happened after the Bible. And I didn't even think like, oh, the apostles taught people who wrote things. Like I didn't know that like the literal apostles taught people and we have their writings. Like that changed everything. And so being able to read what Irenaeus was taught by Polycarp, like Polycarp wrote things and St. Ignatius of Antioch, John also taught Ignatius and Polycarp. Ignatius has a lot of writings, but Irenaeus has like huge amounts of writings. And so it's just more to look at. And so, yes, it was very influential. And yeah, he's my patron saint. Love him. He also solved a huge issue with the Pope. So there was something called the Easter controversy because the um, churches in the East were celebrating Easter on a different day. And Pope Victor was like, you're getting excommunicated. He tried to excommunicate so many Christians. And Irenaeus talked to him and he's like, yo, calm down, not worth, <laughs> not worth excommunicating that many Christians over. So he solved the... Um, Easter controversy. <laughs> okay. Ricardo says, I love you. I love you too. How are you? It's actually really funny because when I'm replying to Instagram DMs, I'll like write hearts after to show my support and love. And sometimes I'm like, oh, that's a guy. And I like wrote like a pink heart after my message or I'm like, oh, love you so much. And I'm like, wait, like, is this awkward because you're a guy? And a lot of times I'm like, no, I love feeling the love too. So never know how I'm coming across though. <laughs> Idara K, hey, what are we talking about here though? So I just did an hour live stream. We've been here for 72 minutes talking about five tips for people who are wanting to convert into Catholicism. And now we're just doing a Q&A, answering any questions. So if you want me to talk about the topic you want this to be about, then ask a question. Kimberly says, hi, Lizzie, you look so pretty. I love your hair and makeup today. I got a um, new palette for Christmas. It's like a highlight palette, but it also has, this is like a bronzer. And then this, a lot of people are like white as highlight, but a highlight is actually like shimmer tan. Anyways, I think I'm never going to use this one. It does not look good with my skin tone. My, I had a bronzer palette from Anastasia, I believe. And it also had a color like this that does not look good with my skin tone. Anyways, anyways, it's sparkly and I really love sparkles. So I did some glitter contour. I think for so long contour, I viewed as like a way to just like change your face shape. And I was like, that's not healthy. But glitter contour, it's like, oh, like it's so cute. You guys see the highlight? So fun. Actually, I used to use a like a kid's glitter lip gloss for my highlight for like a year on my YouTube channel because one of my friends gave me a gift and I think she didn't realize that it was like, the it was like 
not a lip gloss. It was like chunks of glitter. So I used this like kids glitter lip gloss on my highlight and it was actually like the best highlight ever. I got so many compliments on it. So I need to find that and use kids glitter. But I think one of the coolest things with makeup is knowing that you can use highlight as eyeshadow and eyeshadow as like eyebrow and bronzer and everything like that. So I have to use like a tan color. So in between like here and my eyebrow. So this color, I always have like a tan like eyeshadow. So I've just been using this one as the color there. So, yeah. Kurt says, yay for no excommunication. <laughs> M. Kalaf asks or says, greetings from a Chaldean Catholic. My question is so complicated, but can you pass, possibly summarize why Catholic and not Orthodox or point me in a good direction? So when I was becoming Catholic, I did not know if I was gonna be Catholic. I knew I would be Catholic or Orthodox. And I actually attended Orthodox Divine Liturgy, which is their church service for seven months. I not only attended Divine Liturgy every Sunday, I also attended their Vespers service on Wednesday nights and I was in the Bible study. So I was like pro-Orthodox church. I very much wanted to be Orthodox. I'd been to mass before and honestly, like the, um, <laughs> I talked about in my Why I'm Becoming Catholic video, I don't even like the vibe of Catholicism. <laughs> and people thought it was so funny. And they're like, what does she mean? She doesn't like the vibe of Catholicism. But I honestly just like didn't like how mass was. I didn't like the feeling of it. Whereas like Orthodox Divine Liturgy, I super vibed with like the moment I actually went to a Russian Orthodox church in um, college. In my church history class, we were required to go to Orthodox Catholic and Protestant. And so I went there once. I thought it was super weird. I did not vibe with it. But in 2017, I was reading a lot about the early church and stuff and I was just like in a better headspace. And so I remember the second time ever I went to an Orthodox church, I loved it. Like mass, I hated. I was so uncomfortable, but like Orthodox divine liturgy, I loved. I like, <laughs> Okay, so my experience, first time going to this Orthodox church, and it was in English, not in um, Greek or Russian or anything, I was just like, Jesus was alive on earth. The apostles were real people. This literally happened. They were on earth. I, you know, I believed that my whole life, and I read the Bible so much my whole life, but like seeing on the iconostasis, all of these icons of the apostles, of St. Paul, John the Baptist, Jesus, Mary, seeing all the images up there and looking at them like the entire time when you're, you know, like sitting facing forward, just seeing all of the icons there together, it brought the Bible alive. And it's crazy because I was a Christian my entire life. I loved it, super passionate about it, most exciting part of life. And then just being in divine liturgy and looking up i was like this really happened they were actual people like you just see it and it comes alive three-dimensional and so that's what orthodox divine liturgy felt like and there were so many other icons everywhere else so very much vibed with the art and also just the fact that like the whole thing is a song i just thought it was so beautiful and yeah just the incense everything loved it so i really vibed with orthodox a lot and it was heartbreaking when i had to become catholic like heartbreaking i did not want to be catholic i wanted to be orthodox and so it was really hard 
But ultimately, I think the arguments that the Roman bishop had more authority than the other bishops, I think is very clear in the early church. I talked about the Easter controversy, which is a great example. And I was talking about how my patron, St. Irenaeus, who just became a doctor of the church, Pope Victor was trying to excommunicate the Eastern churches for when they celebrated Easter. They said that the apostle John said it was okay to celebrate on this day. And it's very interesting because with Pope Victor, there was never this dialogue of you don't have the authority to excommunicate hundreds of churches. It was just like, you don't have to do this. Like, please don't do this. It wasn't this narrative of like, what are you doing? You can't, you don't have the authority to do this. It was like asking him personally to not make that decision. And the same thing happened with the baptism controversy where there were people who, if someone grew up in like a Christian heretic group and was baptized there and then becoming Catholic, it was, they were like, you have to be rebaptized. The first baptism isn't real. And the Roman bishop was saying, you can't, the first baptism is a real baptism. It's sacrilege to get baptized again, to do the sacrament again. And so it was the same thing where it was like this huge controversy in the church and like Rome ended up winning over even though it wasn't the minority. And so those are two cases in like the early church where this is going on. And I just see so much evidence with St. Ignatius of Antioch, St. Irenaeus writing about the Pope. I just think that, oh, Pope Clement, Pope Clement's letter to the Romans is what I'm thinking of. That the, um, like seeing different scholars talk about that and explain what, what certain wording would have meant at the time. These documents to me just really convinced me that Catholicism is true. And ultimately like the Orthodox and Catholic church were the original church together. And we agree on almost everything. <laughs> I need to make a video 10 lies Orthodox Christians believe about Catholicism because I think that a lot of times we're talking past each other when we think we disagree. Like people are like, Orthodox don't believe in purgatory. And it's like, we agree on it. <laughs> we just describe it differently. So yeah, there are barely any differences. And I honestly am more sad about Orthodox Christians not being part of Catholicism than Protestants, just because we're so similar and we agree on almost everything. And so it's very heartbreaking. And obviously, if I read something that con massively contradicted or a little bit contradicted the things that I've read, I of course would be open to becoming Orthodox. And if something happened in Catholicism where the Pope did something that contradicted past teaching, original teaching, of course, if I was like, this cannot happen if Catholicism is true, if this is the teaching of the absolutely, I would become Orthodox and I would be kind of happy about that. <laughs> I mean, obviously it would be heartbreaking for Catholicism to not be true, but I, I like the vibe of the Orthodox Church a lot. And of course, any Catholic can become Eastern Catholic and attend a Byzantine Catholic church or Melkite or something. So I'm currently really happy with the church I go to, but in the future, my fiance and I might become Byzantine Catholic. We're very open to it. So it's not something that's like not a part of my life, but like currently I've been really enjoying Novus Ordo Latin Rite Mass, but honestly, like if I start going to Byzantine, liturgy too much it like ruins regular mass for me so yeah i probably will in the future depending on like where i live and if we live near a church and stuff like that i totally could be just straight up become byzantine catholic so that's totally an option so love that but yeah i would definitely be excited to become orthodox so What is your take on the difference Catholic and Orthodox have on Augustine? So I actually was rewatching one of my videos, 10 Lies Catholics, 
10 lies Protestants believe about Catholics because my new YouTube video, which is gonna go up on Monday, I'm finished with it. It is, uh, it's like 10 factors in my life, throughout my life that helped me become Catholic. And so I have different clips from different old videos in it, like a ton of them just to show like my thinking changing in real time. And so it's hilarious. I have a clip from my 10 lies, Catholics, 10 Lies Protestants Believe About Catholics video. I'm like, my main disagreement with Catholicism is Augustine. And I was like, he was in the group, the religion Manichaeanism, who disagreed. They didn't like the body and the physical realm. And then when Augustine went back to being Catholic, even though he disagreed with it, it was subliminally affecting his ideology. And then he changed, completely changed the Catholic's view on sex. I didn't say it completely changed. But yeah, I was like, Augustine is where I disagree with Catholicism. And I think I, I think a lot of people can see his writings on original sin, things like that, as like this big change. And a lot of people don't realize that like we can read things hundreds of years before this where they're sharing very, very, very similar views on original sin and baptism and all of these things. And so it's wrong that that's like the first time that showing up and something as well is like a lot of people have this argument from ignorance where if we don't see a certain theology talked about in like the third century, the first century, the second century, it didn't exist. Like people think that the first time we have a written document is when that theology was invented. And this is the ancient world. Like we don't have everything. And so even if there isn't any writing earlier sharing a certain theology, that doesn't mean that it didn't exist before that. So that's very important. And I think that's an issue that like a lot of Protestants especially fall into about that. So. <laughs> Julia S says, hi Lizzie. I've watched you for a few years, but this is the first live, live stream I've watched. I usually watch your old live streams while I'm making dinner. Oh. I do the same thing when I'm cooking. I watch YouTubers live streams. It's so nice because I feel like YouTube videos I love watching because there's so much like cool editing and visuals and different shots and like you want to have the visual experience but with live streams it's like there's no editing someone's just talking so you can just listen to it. It's not like you're missing out on like any visuals. You're missing out on my glitter contour makeup. That's the only thing that you're not seeing when you're rewatching. Okay. <laughs> uh, what are we at? Uh, 87 minutes. We have like 30 minutes left. I actually have been realizing that I've been like manic the past month, but medicated. And so it's like slightly affecting me because I have like a Google Doc of live stream ideas and video ideas that has like 50 ideas for each. And I just like go through and like write out video scripts and videos and like, da -da -da -da, but like slowly, it's so weird. It's like, I can't focus on one thing. And if I was manic, I would just like get a ton of productivity done. But because I'm not, it's like that manic energy of like, idea, 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 idea. I'm like not completing something, but like slowed down. Okay, Kimberly Rose. I'm falling more and more in love with Catholicism. I'm a baptized Christian and my husband is a non-baptized Christian. If I convert, will my marriage be considered valid? Like, will I be able to partake in the Eucharist? So, you cannot receive the Eucharist until you're fully initiated into the church, even if you're baptized as a Protestant, that if it was a Trinitarian baptism with water, so if they said in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, if they named the Trinity, 
and there was water, it's a Catholic baptism, it's a valid baptism, but you're not confirmed into the church. And so you can't receive the Eucharist as a convert until you're confirmed. So it wouldn't matter either way, like if your marriage is valid or not, but um, that's something where you'd have to talk about your marriage with the priest at your church and figure that out. Um, I mean, you're not, I don't have any information on it right now. So even if I had more information, I might not be able to know, but, um, a lot of Protestant weddings are valid because for a marriage to be valid, what's necessary is the husband and wife there. What's necessary for the sacrament. So like for a lot of sacraments, it requires a priest like for confession and for the Eucharist, for turning the bread and wine into Jesus' physical body, it requires apostolic succession of the bishops and priests or it doesn't work. But in marriage, you do not have to have apostolic succession. What you need is the man and the woman do the marriage, make it the sacrament. So a lot of Protestant marriages are valid. So. I don't know. I don't know if you'll have a problem or not. I know that like if you eloped or something in a courthouse is probably not valid, but yeah, there's canon lawyers. <laughs> Seriously, there's Catholics who like no Catholic law who will be able to hear your situation and figure out what's going on. But um, if you do have to have a wedding, a re-wedding, it's actually really sweet. So one of the people who was in RCIA, so in my RCIA, basically like this couple, he grew up Catholic and then left the church as like a kid and was never confirmed and everything. And his marriage with his wife wasn't valid for whatever reason. And so he couldn't receive the Eucharist because they didn't have a real marriage. So they weren't allowed to have sex. So what he did is they just stopped having sex for like four months so that he could receive the Eucharist. So yeah, you don't have to like move out or anything. You just don't have sex. And then like, if you grew up Catholic, you could receive the Eucharist, but it seems like it's not an issue. I don't think you have to stop having sex in your marriage. I don't know. You could talk to your priest about it. I don't know. There are so many individual situations. There's a lot of details and stuff going on, but um, yeah, you can just get married again. It's pretty easy. It doesn't need to be like you invite hundreds of people to it. Oh, my story though. So this couple invited all of us to their wedding and it was like really chill. Like there weren't many people. It was just like with our priest, but yeah, they had to like get married. They didn't make a big deal about it, but yeah. I mean, a lot of people feel offended that you're like, your marriage wasn't a real marriage. <laughs> like people get very offended by that, but um, yeah. It's true, some of them aren't real. So yeah, you could talk to a canon lawyer, you'll talk to your priest and you'll um, figure it out. Lizzie, what are your thoughts on Judaism and Jewish people since that's the religion in which Christianity originated from? So there are so many similarities between Judaism and Catholicism. And that's what attracts a lot of people to Catholicism. One example is just the way we understand the Bible not being sola scriptura, but always having these other writings to help us understand how to interpret the Bible. Judaism has always been like that too, where they never just have like the scripture to understand, but they always have the interpretations of it. And so that's extremely similar. Also, praying to the dead is something that they do as well. And so it's like this intermediary state, like purgatory. That's something that it's like that ideology is similar as well. And when I was thinking of being Catholic, people were like, like writing lists of all the similarities between Judaism and Catholicism. And I was like, I don't want to be like Judaism. Jesus got rid of it. But there's a lot of Bible verses that I reread and it's like, oh, like one of the things is obviously there's that verse, not a letter of the law, not an iota will go away until everything's fulfilled. Jesus says that, but also there is a Bible passage and Jesus is like, 
this is actually like, sorry. <laughs> this is a really, really big argument. So I think it's, I don't know. I don't want to say the wrong Bible verse. I just want to Google it. So Jesus, oh, okay. My charger just fell off. So Jesus is talking about the chief priests and he's like, they sit on Moses' seat, do, do what they say, not what they do because they're hypocrites. And let me just read this in. I'm pretty sure it's, I don't want to say it the wrong way. Let's see. Nope, totally wrong on the chapter. Okay, I'm glad I didn't say it. Is it? No, why do I not have this memorized? I thought I did. Okay, I'll just Google the, um, sit on Moses seat. Let's see. Oh, Matthew 23. I was so off. Wow. Okay. Matthew 23. Okay. Okay. So Matthew 23 verse one. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Guess what Catholicism has? Peter's seat. Interesting. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. So a lot of people focus on Jesus condemning the religious leaders because he is constantly doing that in the Gospels. And so people see that and they think he was trying to get rid of like the religious leadership and the political establishment in Judaism. And so people view it as like Jesus was against structure. He was completely against like a political leadership structure in Christianity because he condemned them so much. But it's fascinating that this one verse in Matthew 23, Jesus says, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do. So they're hypocrites. And then after this, there's a large passage Jesus says that's very iconic and famous. And I think like when I read this growing up, I remember the part after it more than verse one, because it's like so intense and amazing and so i think we just like that's not a verse that like stands out you know what i mean so i'll read the rest of matthew 23. so he's talking about the um scribes and pharisees who sit on moses seat they tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the soldiers shoulders of others but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them they do all their deeds to be seen by others for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you are all students. So that's the part that sticks out to us. Of course, him just like this, I mean, you could apply this to so many things. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the soldiers. I mean, this can apply to our political system, honestly. So yeah, but Jesus says, do as they say, not as they do. So he wasn't getting rid of it at all. And the whole Moses seat, Peter's seat. So yeah, Catholicism points that out as something that continued. And Jesus ultimately was not trying to get rid of it. He agreed with the religious structure, political element. And that is something very clear as well in the Annunciation when Gabriel asks Mary if she wants to be the mother of God. And he is, Gabriel is talking about Jesus' legacy and how he's going to be a king in the line of David. 
And I think a lot of people, they think of like Jesus kingship as being like this spiritual metaphor thing. But in actuality, it was like with Christianity setting up the structure of the Pope, it's like very in line with a physical kingdom on earth. And something Catholics say all the time is bringing heaven to earth and making earth like heaven. And there was this position in the Old Testament, which reading more of the Old Testament is like the key to understanding Catholicism and interpreting the New Testament. And there was this position in the Davidic monarchy, which Gabriel is saying that Jesus is continuing and fulfilling. And it is a second in command position to the king and if the king ever like leaves the city, this second in command position is in charge. And then, and it's called the steward. And so the steward carried like physical keys to the city, like around his shoulder, like physical keys. <laughs> and so then, anyways, the steward was in charge if the king ever left the city. And then if the steward died, he was replaced by another steward who carried the keys. And so then in Matthew 16, when Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, the 12 apostles are Jewish. They know the Old Testament inside and out. And so when Jesus says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom, he's referring to the steward position carrying the physical keys. And so to a Jewish audience hearing that, they're like, what? Peter is going to be the steward. He's carrying the keys to the kingdom. And Jesus leaves. He's in heaven. And so the steward is left in charge of the Pope, who will then pass on the keys to the next Pope, and the next Pope, and the next Pope. And so it's this like kingdom, physical kingdom on earth. And in my video I'm uploading on Monday, I talk about how America is very like anti-authority. And so I think my hatred of a political system within the church is because I'm like anti-authority. But in actuality, if we understand the way the original audience would have understand Matthew 16 of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, it totally makes sense. And actually Lord of the Rings has a steward position in it. And cause, okay, I don't know anything about Lord of the Rings. I've seen a couple of the movies, so I don't want to say anything, but anyways, the steward position is in Lord of the Rings. So a lot of people are like, oh, like I understand how that works because of the um, books and movies, but it's also in the Old Testament. So, and the um, mom was the queen, not the wife of the king. So like when Solomon was king, Solomon is the son of David, his mom Bathsheba was the queen. And so that's why Jesus' mom Mary is the queen. <laughs> Okay. Will Strasserberger says, Hi, Lizzie. I am a Catholic seminarian studying in Florida. God bless you. I remember you in my prayers tomorrow. Oh, I hope you're having so much fun. I lived in Florida for five years when I was in high school. My parents still live there. So I always get to visit South Florida when I'm there. Beautiful place. I really want to live there in the future. So we'll see. Just because of the housing prices and one of my, two of my best friends live there and their families, so, and my parents, so it'd be a cool place to live. So who knows? Trevor and I can live in so many different places. So we'll see where we end up. Growing up, I always moved to a new place every five years. So I'm like very comfortable uprooting and moving and everything. <laughs> Nathan Tucker says, hey Lizzie, hope you're doing well. Yes, I've been doing so well. I have really like intensified my prayer life in January just because I went to this like amazing confession. I was experiencing like a ton of anger randomly in the beginning of the year. And I was talking about it in confession because I'd said some things and I was like, not okay to talk to people like that. And so I was in confession and I was talking about like all my anger and stuff. And I was like, this is not me. I've never done this before. This is not 
how I act. And the priest was like listening to me talk about different areas of my life where I was experiencing all this anger. And he was like, you're being spiritually attacked. And I was like terrified. And I was like, started praying a ton. Cause I was like, I want to get past this. I need to be saturated in God. So yeah, I just really, really, really intensified my prayer life and my spirituality. And I just have gotten so much closer to God and I feel very grateful for my life. And I think 2021 was very hard and it wasn't like a pain stabbing emotion. It was just kind of like a fog and apathy and definitely a lack of creativity. And I like, I wasn't in pain, you know what I mean? And so I didn't think of it as like, I'm sad or like I'm having a hard time, but it was just like kind of a nothingness. And so focusing so much on my prayer life, I just feel so much happier and I'm treating people better. I'm more social, I'm more outgoing. I'm just putting more passion into what I'm doing and to work. And it's just amazing how focusing so much more on prayer, just like, completely changes your life. Like I am just so thankful for everything. I'm like, my life is perfect. I love what's going on. And I just haven't felt like that in a while. And it's crazy how just a different perspective changes everything. So yeah, I just feel very peaceful, extremely grateful. I'm very happy where I'm at. And I'm really happy that I've just intensified my prayer life. And I was thinking yesterday after work, I was just so happy. And I was thinking like, God wants us to be happy. <laughs> and I think a lot of times we think about how we have suffering as Christians and Christianity is not just like, it doesn't bring us like happiness. You know what I mean? Like there's struggles you go through as a Christian and it's sacrificial. It's not about like seeking pleasure, but ultimately like God does give us joy and peace in our relationships with him. And even like the Christian martyrs were like joyful and thankful as they were being killed. And so they're really, it's normal to have an emotion of like thankfulness and peace and joy. Like that is normal. And I think for me, because of my bipolar, I'm just very like skeptical of emotions coming from God because when I'm manic, I feel this like hyper spirituality and like so close to God and so much joy and peace. And so I'm just very like skeptical of that. I'm like, I don't think that's real, but yeah, this year I've really been feeling that and it has nothing to do with a bipolar episode. And so yeah, it's been really nice. Arturo Cabello, you have the same name as Camila Cabello. So cool. Any places you have in your travel list, Catholic wise. I definitely want to go to Mexico City to see Our Lady of Guadalupe. I want to go to Rome. I want to go to Aranese's home in Lyon, France. I really, really, really want to see the Holy Land in Israel. I think that would be amazing. And I think all of Europe is like amazing Catholic Catholicism touring. And honestly, like every time I travel now, not even like for Catholic things, just to like visit friends on vacations and stuff. I always go to the Catholic churches in the area and it actually has made traveling so much more fun because everywhere you go, you get to see beautiful Catholic churches and it's so cool when I've been to different countries and seeing what mass is like there, cause it's very similar, but also very different and so beautiful. I went to the Bahamas last year and they, oh my goodness, everyone sung together so loud. Every time they said Jesus name, they all bowed together and they were just like so into it, so passionate about it. So I really enjoyed that a lot. And interestingly enough, it was in English. So it's very interesting and so cool having mass in English in another country because I have done mass in Ireland and Canada too. So yeah, because it's like, of course there's different like vibes of mass and cultures within the US, 
but in another country also in English, it's very cool because you, I mean, even when I go to like Spanish mass in the US, I know everything that's going on because you have mass memorized, but it's cooler like being in your language and understanding it, but like having a different essence with the way you're feeling it. So in the Bahamas, I was in um, Nassau and they had like so many like shell, these like shell stations, the cross. It was very cool. I love how art is so different in every country too. Where is Ephesus? Well, let's see which, what is the modern country? Sorry, I entered my password in wrong. What is going, oh, I have caps locks on. Okay, let's see Ephesus. It's loading. I don't know when my internet is being slow. Okay. Greece. Oh, it's so pretty. They have the ruins of it. That's so cool. Oh, I want to go to Pompeii really bad i think that'd be amazing we had we talked about pompeii in one of my religion classes in college a ton and one of our textbooks is like a picture book that just shows like a ton of parts of it with like a ton of yeah i look through it a lot i think it's super cool <laughs> have you ever been to new mexico i think so i don't remember maybe on a flight layover I don't know but yeah maybe I don't think I've been there like exploring or something I might have driven through it so Matthew Norton what do you think about the new American Bible so that's actually in the United States the translation of the Bible we use at mass and my Catholic Bible I'll show you guys it is new American Bible This I highly recommend. It's the Little Rock, sorry, my ring light, Little Rock Catholic Study Bible. It has so many, so much commentary and stuff in it. It's NAB. I also like the NRSV, that's like the Catholic Scholar Bible. So um, not just Catholicism, but like scholar translation that a lot of people use. So in my YouTube videos, when I have like a screenshot of a Bible verse, I use NRSV a lot. So yeah, both are great translations. I think it's really cool reading the Bible in different translations because you just get like different vibes from it. Travis says, I live in New Mexico. Aw. What I'm going to start doing with my friends is a lot of like nature-y national park type trips. Cause we always just like either go to the beach or like visit in a city and do a ton of stuff like that. So I want to start doing like camping and like national parks and stuff. Cause I am a very like adventurous outdoorsy person, but I don't know with friends, we just like never did that. So my sister constantly goes to national parks with her friends. So yeah, that's what we're going to do. I've been camping and national parks with my friends, but not like a ton when we visit each other. Travis says, you're welcome here anytime, Lizzie. Aw. It's honestly so cool how gigantic our country is and how much beautiful nature is in it. I love it so much. I know so many countries have that, but I'm really grateful that ours just has like so many options of beautiful things to see and do. Nathan says, have you ever been to North Carolina? That's where I'm from. Yes, I've been there a ton. I have friends and family who live there. So love it, it's so beautiful. Travis says, I should bring you here to speak at a church. Yeah, that would be a fun reason to go. Sky Mars, one state near California. We have a historic organ at our church. You would also like the Holy Shrine of El Santaro. I think I misspelled that. Ooh, what is a historic organ? Is it like one of the oldest organs or is it like a gigantic organ? <laughs> I actually have very much grown to love organ music at mass. I used to hate it, but now I think it's really beautiful. <laughs> 
call me Daniel says, yes, do NRS fee when you quote scripture on your videos and AB will get you in trouble with who? My Protestant viewers? <laughs> I've never thought about that, about what would be best for a van. I mean, maybe I have, and that's why I use NRS fee, but yeah, that's interesting. I don't know if Protestants have like strong opinions against it. Are there some translations that are like sketchy? <laughs> Oh, here's a comment that I missed earlier. Kimberly Rose. I have small children and one thing I worry about is my kids going to confession. Like I can see how it could be a healing experience, but I worry that in the eyes of a child, it could be traumatic. Are there any resources or discussions I can look into on the emotional safety for children going to confession? I think the only way it could not be safe is if their teacher at their kids class taught it in a really sketchy, toxic way. But if you're Catholic or you're like converting in, like your children know about the faith because of how you talk about the faith. Like, yes, their catechism class and like teachers at their church affect them, but like 90% of it is the parents. Bishop Barron actually made a YouTube video on this recently about how the reason people are leaving the church the parents' responsibility, like that's what keeps people in the church, their parents and how they raise them. And so as long as you teach it in a non-toxic way, like their experience is going to be based upon how you talk about it. Like you have so much control and power over the way your children understand it. So if you're someone who has like a healthy relationship with it, you'll pass that on to them. I know a lot of people who grew up Catholic and the people whose parents are like very devout and who raised them Catholic and were very into their faith did not have a negative experience. So I think the people who do, their parents are like not participating Catholics. They're not practicing Catholics. It's like something they're kind of into, but not like, you know, going to mass every week and like understanding it really well and like praying as a family and stuff. So if you are very involved in your faith and you have a healthy understanding of confession, I think it would be fine. I have thought a lot about confession and children and everything. And I think one of the things that I'm really going to foster at home is apologizing to my kids when I do something that is wrong, if I hurt them unintentionally, apologizing and telling my children and my husband like, I'm so sorry I said that to you. I'm going to go to confession and talk about it. And I think modeling for them that things we confess, it's a way to heal is very powerful. I know for me, I've never felt excessive guilt in Catholicism because I go to confession and I'm free of it. And so it's definitely a way to not deal with guilt. And everyone's different. Like I know as a kid, I never had issues where I like replayed memories and felt bad about things. But if your child does have a personality where they look back on the past and they're analyzing it constantly, I think confession could be what gives your child peace because they're able to get it out in confession. So I also will read a ton of Catholic parenting books and stuff for how to present it. But ultimately, if you have a healthy view of confession and just have a healthy relationship with God in the sacraments, I would not worry how your kids view it. But also talk to your kids like, how was your experience? You know what I mean? Involve yourself in their lives and ask them what they're going through and how they're experiencing it. It needs to be like an open conversation for sure. And I'm very excited to have children and parent them and teach them the Catholic faith. And I grew up Christian. My parents were Christian. I never, ever felt like rules in Christianity were affecting my flourishing or I wasn't able to enjoy life or have fun because of rules in Christianity. 
and they always made faith this beautiful, joyful thing. And I think a lot of people who leave Christianity or have a negative experience, it's because their parents were not fully living it out. Their parents didn't have a healthy relationship with it. They might have viewed it as an obligation or a burden rather than something that is like the core and center of their life. And so as a parent, don't worry, you're in complete control. If you focus on having a healthy relationship with God and a healthy understanding of the church, you're going to pass that on to your children. It's a lot of responsibility raising children, but the purpose of marriage in Catholicism is to help your spouse get to heaven and to raise children and educate them in Catholicism. <laughs> okay. I have very much enjoyed this live stream. I'm gonna go make dinner. So excited to go to mass tomorrow. I love you guys so much. Keep wearing your N95 and KN95 masks. Make sure to put them in paper lunch sack bags for three to five days before wearing them again so that they get re-sanitized and you can keep wearing them. I love you guys so much and I will see you in my next video, which is on Monday, 10 factors in my life that help me become Catholic. I have a ton of B-roll footage on it from past videos. It's going to be such a fun video to watch. I love you guys a lot. I'll see you next Saturday night in a live stream again. Bye.